I'm extremely excited because I have a very special video for you today. This is sure to be a welcome sight for the old school D&D gamers, but it's also a piece of interesting D&D history for everyone else. So relax and get ready to learn everything you need to know about the very first basic edition of Dungeons & Dragons. As always, I'm your host Atten here at We Love TTRPGs, and this is the third edition of the Holmes Basic Rules. This book was published in 1979, and these 47 pages is how I learned to play Dungeons & Dragons. Now, when describing the Holmes Basic set, I will assume you are already familiar with D&D terms like hit dice, experience points, character classes, ability scores, and similar common TTRPG game concepts. But before I walk you through this, let's take a quick look at its origins. The original true first edition of Dungeons & Dragons was that little white box set from 1974. It had three books, the 36-page Men in Magic, the 40-page Monsters and Treasure, and the 36-page The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. There were four supplements released for that edition of the game. There was Supplement 1, Greyhawk, which added the Thief and Paladin classes, new combat rules, new spells, new monsters, and new treasures. Supplement 2, Blackmore, added the Assassin and Monk classes, Hit Location rules, Underwater Adventuring, Monsters, Treasures, and the Temple of the Frog Adventure. A supplement 3 was Eldritch Wizardry, which added the Druid class, Psionics, Demons, Psionic Monsters, and Artifacts. As I discussed in my Sci-Fi Meets Fantasy video, Gary Gygax said that he ultimately regretted Psionics being added to the game. He never used them in his own games, and he had planned on having them removed from the game with the second edition AD&D rules. Unfortunately, he was pushed out of the company in 1986 and Psionics remained in the game. The final supplement, number four, was Gods, Demigods, and Heroes, which added various pantheons, including Egyptian, Hindu, Greek, Celtic, Norse, Finnish, Aztec, Mayan, Chinese, and Japanese mythologies. It also had the fictional mythos of authors Robert E. Howard and Michael Moorcock. When the three-book white box set was released, players were told to use the chainmail rules to resolve combat. This was the wargaming miniatures rules that included some tables at the back for fantasy combat. And gamers who did not own that book were required to use the combat system included in the Men and Magic book, and that is the origins of the 1D20 combat system we still use today. Because of how convoluted and confusing this could all be to new players, Gary Gygax sought to have a streamlined, accessible version of the game released. From Dragon Magazine number 14, released in May of 1978, Gary explained, Organizational work was in progress when correspondence with J. Eric Holmes, a professor, author, and incidentally a respected neurologist, disclosed that the good doctor was interested in undertaking the first stage of the project, the rewriting and editing necessary to extract a beginner's set of D&D from the basic set and its supplements. The result of his labors is the basic set of D&D. And that obviously worked out because that's how I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons. The Holmes Basic Set, named after its author, Dr. J. Eric Holmes, was first released in 1977. Its purpose was to provide a simplified and accessible entry point for novice players. The Holmes rules only covered the first three levels of play and featured streamlined rules and mechanics making it easier for newcomers to grasp the intricacies of the game. As time progressed, the Holmes Basic Set underwent several revisions and updates to enhance the gameplay experience. As I mentioned at the start of this video, my copy is the third edition of the Holmes Basic, and it was published in 1979. The changes made in the updated releases were meant to address player feedback and refine the rule set. This continual evolution ensured that the Holmes Basic Set remained relevant and engaging. The Holmes Basic Set was sold by TSR from early 1977 through 1980. There was both the box set or just the rule book as a standalone product for less money. The box set would contain different components depending on when you purchased it. Early basic sets came with the supplement Dungeon Geomorph Assortment, set one through three basic dungeons, caves and caverns, lower dungeons. This was later replaced with the adventure module B1 in search of the unknown. And then later releases of the box set traded out B1 for Gary Gygax's adventure B2, The Keep on the Borderlands. 
One other feature of Holmes Basic is it came with either a set of five colored and inked polyhedral dice, D4, D6, D8, D12, and D20, or six monochromatic and uninked dice, adding a D10 with a crayon to fill in the numbers. At one point during a dice shortage, the box set included a cardboard sheet of numbered chits intended for random number generation. The copies with the numbered chits included coupons to purchase a set of polyhedral dice when they were available. The Holmes Basic set made a significant impact in the D&D community, becoming a stepping stone for countless aspiring adventurers such as myself. Character creation was quite a bit different from what we're used to today. Character classes for this rule set included fighting men, magic users, clerics, and thieves. A human character could choose any of those classes. In addition to those, there was dwarf, elf, and halfling, which were not just different fantasy races, but also classes unto themselves. I'll explain that more in a bit, but first you had to generate your ability scores. Character creation was quite a bit different from what we're used to today. In the Holmes Basic Edition, players roll just three six-sided dice for each ability, providing scores ranging from three to 18. Abilities were then as they are still today. Strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. The rules also included an unusual mechanism for raising a character's prime requisite. Magic users and clerics could add one point to their prime requisite for every three points of strength they sacrificed. Fighters, clerics, halflings, and dwarves could add one point to their prime requisite for every two points of intelligence they sacrificed. Fighters, halflings, and dwarves could add one point to their prime requisite for every three points of wisdom they sacrificed. It's important to know that no ability could be reduced below nine when using this point spin system. Having a prime requisite of 13 or greater would grant a bonus to earned experience points, just as having a score of seven or less would result in a penalty. After recording your ability scores, a player would then choose a character class. The rules state that their options were based on the strongest ability score and personal choice. The available classes were, as I just previously mentioned, Fighting Men, now called the Fighter, Magic User, now called the Wizard, Thief, now called the Rogue, and the Cleric. As previously stated, humans could select any of those professions. Added to these options were Elves, Halflings, and Dwarves, which are considered classes. Additionally, from page 7, Holmes states, there are a number of other character types which are detailed in advanced Dungeons and Dragons. There are subclasses of the four basic classes. There are paladins and rangers, fighting men, illusionists and witches, magic users, monks and druids, clerics, and assassins, thieves. There are half-elves. Special characteristics for dwarves, elves, and halfling thieves are given. In addition, rules for characters who possess the rare talent of psionic ability are detailed. However, for a beginning campaign, these additions are not necessary, and players should accustom themselves to regular play before adding further complexities. At the Dungeon Master's discretion, a character can be anything his or her player wants him to be. Characters must always start out inexperienced and relatively weak and build on their experience. Thus, an expedition might include, in addition to the four basic classes and races, human, elven, dwarves, halflings, a centaur, a lawful werebear, and a Japanese samurai fighting man. Did you catch that bit about characters must always start out inexperienced and relatively weak? I think that is an important difference from old school D&D compared to the 4th and 5th editions of the game. Perhaps 3rd edition D&D was guilty of this too, but Fourth and fifth are just the worst examples where you begin the game with a character that is already fairly indestructible. Older gamers question what's the point in playing a game when there's really little to no chance of failure. And those new to D&D, you're missing out on the thrill of surviving insurmountable odds to grow into a mighty hero. When you hear older players complaining about fifth edition D&D, that superhero quality seems to be their primary gripe. The Holmes rules had a simple description for character alignment. Time and movement is described as a fully armored man can move 120 feet per turn at a cautious walk, and each such turn lasts 10 minutes in game. An unarmored and unencumbered man can move twice as far. 
It also says one turn out of every six should be spent motionless resting. Combat uses a different measurement of time where there are 10 melee rounds per turn and each round lasts 10 seconds. During combat, an armored man moves 10 feet per round and an unencumbered individual moves 20 feet. It says movement during combat is usually done at a sprint. The rules tell us that elves and dwarves can see 60 feet in the dark, as can all monsters and evil characters controlled by the DM. For experience points, the rules tell us that halflings and dwarves progress as fighting men, and elves progress in two areas, fighting men and magic user. Fighting men and dwarves use eight-sided dice for hit points, but halflings and elves use six-sided dice. Magic users, clerics, and thieves all have their own individual experience point progressions. Clerics use six-sided dice for hit points, while magic users and thieves use four-sided dice. Thieves have the skills for open lock, remove traps, pick pockets, move silently, climb walls, and hide in shadows, which all use percentile dice to determine success. A thieves hear noise skill operated like any characters using a six-sided dice, but it improved as they increased in character level. Magic users and clerics had the ability to cast spells not too different than what we're familiar with today, and clerics could turn undead. In 5th edition D&D, you make saving throws based on ability scores against an opposing difficulty, and the Holmes edition saving throws were based on character class versus the effect targeting the character. Effect categories included spell or magic staff, magic wand, death ray or poison, petrification called turn to stone, and finally dragon breath. This was essentially the same system that would reappear in subsequent basic and expert rules as well as 1st and 2nd edition AD&D. For combat initiative, it says that when two figures first come within 10 feet of one another, the combatant with the higher dexterity strikes first. It instructs the DM to roll the dexterity for a monster or NPC if it is not known. Combat then proceeds repeating this process. However, if the combatants have dexterities within one or two points of each other, a six-sided dice is rolled and the higher result may attack first. Attackers who surprise their opponent or approach from behind always get first strike opportunity. This is all further complicated by the rule stating that when a magic user says he is getting a spell ready, their spell goes off first. This is followed by missile fire. But after melee combat has begun, no further missile fire is permitted due to the danger of hitting a friendly target. It then tells us that if a magic user is not involved in the melee, he can get another spell off in one or more melee rounds. Looking back at the spells, we see spell levels, range, and duration, but there's no casting times. Also, magic users and clerics only began with one spell at first level. Combat used a matrix for character level versus the defender's armor class. Fifth edition D&D players would find this part of the old school rules most confusing, since it used the descending armor classes where armor class zero was harder to hit than armor class 10. After I graduated to AD&D, it was my good friend Joseph who taught me the term Thaco to hit armor class zero. The monster section had most of the classic familiar names, Blink Dog, Carrion Crawler, Displacer Beast, Doppelganger, Dragon, offering four varieties, white, black, red, and brass, gelatinous cube, giants, which included the same types that appeared in the first edition AD&D monster manual, hill, stone, frost, fire, cloud, and storm. There was green slime, gray ooze, black pudding, and yellow mold. There were purple worms, rust monsters, owlbears, and several varieties of undead, among other common D&D creatures. Notably missing was the mind player, which previously appeared in the original white box D&D supplement, Eldritch Wizardry. But the Holmes basic was only for first through third level characters, so I think we can understand why Elithids didn't make the cut. Monster listings give us their movement, alignment, hit dice, armor class, number of attacks, and damage. Treasure type is given, and the rules tell us that monsters use a D8 for generating hit points. At the end of the book, we have some treasure charts, some magic items, and a brief sample dungeon crawl. I ran many friends through that dungeon, which is how I learned to play the game. Although the home's basic set was not fully compatible with advanced Dungeons and Dragons, players were expected to continue beyond third level by moving to AD&D mechanics, which is what I did. 
and I'll be covering the first and second edition AD&D game in a future upload. There are several retro clones of the first white box D&D rules, but just three notable retro clones of the Holmes rules that I'm aware of. If you know of others, please let us know in the comments. There's Blue Holm by Michael Thomas of Dreamscape Design, Mazes and Perils RPG by Wild Games Productions, and Wizards, Warriors, and Worms. A free PDF is available of that, and I'll provide a link in this video's description down below. There was also the Meepo's Holmes Companion, an unofficial four-page fan-made expansion that extends the Holmes basic D&D rules to allow play from levels four to nine. For clarity, my comments about retro clones are strictly concerned with the Holmes Basic Edition. There are other retro clones of Basic D&D, but those seek to emulate the 1981 Basic set edited by Tom Moldbay and the Expert set by David Zeb Cook. Last night, I purchased a hard copy of the Blue Home book, and when it arrives, I'll do a review of it for you. And there you have it. Everything you need to know about the very first basic edition of Dungeons and Dragons, first published in 1977. Now please let me know in the comments what you think of this Holmes edition of the game. I hope you enjoyed learning this valuable bit of TTRPG history. You can show your support by liking the video. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our future uploads. I'm Atten here at We Love TTRPGs and I wanna thank you so much for watching. Thanks.